Hello, everyone. Welcome to our sports acupuncture webinar. My name is Matt Callison. Hi, I'm Brian Lau. We want to thank the American Acupuncture Council for uh, sponsoring our, our, sport, our sports acupuncture webinar here. Uh, we're from AccuSport Education and the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program. Um, we're going to talk today about tibial stress syndromes. Let's go to the first slide, please. So since spring has sprung and we're quickly approaching summer, we'll start to see patients that are coming in with uh, tibial stress syndromes or the layman term for this being shin splints. Uh, people are trying to be able to get in shape. And so this is a common, very common overuse injury. So uh, Brian and I were chatting just last week. We, uh, we just published our module three lower extremity online recordings through net of knowledge. And we were talking about what we could actually grab from that since it's so fresh in our minds and tibial stress syndromes was the first thing that we thought about. And so this is actually a, uh, it's a fun topic because it is something that most of us, most acupuncturists do see clinically. And there are some techniques that we have found work extremely well for this. So uh, before we jump into the first slide there, Brian, do you want to say anything or do you want to go right into medial stress syndrome? Uh, I'll say something simple, and that is uh, this particular topic is one that I've dealt with, uh, not for a long time, but when I was in high school, I was a wrestler, and we used to do a lot of drills on a hard floor, running drills in these wrestling shoes that had zero support. Um, they're not, you know, they're designed to be on a mat, right? Not on a, not for running shoes, but sometimes being young and stupid, we were lazy and just wore the same shoes as we went out and did running drills and exercises and stuff. So I remember at, in high school, this was... Uh, something that I, I didn't have horribly to where it stopped me, but it was quite painful. So I know this one personally, but uh, fortunately I haven't dealt with it for uh, most of my adult life. But no, other than that, I'm ready to roll. All right. So should we go to the next slide and Brian, you want to take it away? Sure. All right, so as Matt mentioned, uh, shin splints uh, is kind of the layman term uh, for medial and anterior tibial stress syndrome. I'm gonna start uh, the discussion talking about medial tibial stress syndrome. So that'll affect the, the sort of medial side of the tibia. And we'll look at the anatomy and, and kind of mechanism of injury for that. Um, and then uh, I think Matt will take it uh, from the uh, anterior tibial stress syndrome, but collectively people refer to these as shin splints. Um, it's an overuse in, uh, injury inflammatory condition that involves micro tears in either the myofascial origin, so the tibialis anterior, that would be for the anterior tibial stress syndrome, or the tibialis posterior for the medial tibial stress syndrome. Uh, those muscles are along the shaft of the tibia. So let's uh, go to the next slide and we'll jump into medial tibial stress syndrome. So medial tibial stress syndrome, uh, the pain and tenderness is found on the uh, medial, really the posterior medial aspect of the tibia, you know, on the sort of the yin channel side of the leg. Um, so on the medial portion of the tibia, just really on that most posterior aspect. So that would be along the liver channel. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the channels on this slide. But um, it'll be usually the pain is, is level with the area between spleen eight and spleen six. That can be a little less than that. It can go beyond those boundaries, but that's the typical region that it covers. Uh, so that's the, the area that people will tend to have pain that they'll, um, they'll be complaining about. Um, in terms of channels, when we get later in the presentation, we're gonna be looking at a, a myofascial release technique. We're gonna be looking at acupuncture, of course, but then we'll also look at a myofascial release technique. And, and in that uh, particular associated technique, it'll be in reference to the spleen sinew channel. So this injury and the pain is along that distribution of the liver channel, but the channels aren't just a line along the body. You know, they're not only on the surface, so to speak. You know, we're taking a needle and we're, we're penetrating the skin and where that needle goes can be either, either more uh, deep or superficial. So if we were just to glance at this image from Matt's uh, text, uh, Sports Medicine Acupuncture, um, and look at the arrows. The arrows are pointing to the tibialis posterior muscle which is what attaches to the posterior surface of the tibia. And that's what's going to pull excessively, or when it does pull excessively on the tibia, 
and you create little micro tears there, that's going to be what contributes to the medial tibial stress syndrome. But if we look at where those arrowheads sit, not what they're pointing to, they're pointing to tibialis posterior, but where they sit, there'd be another muscle there um, that's not shown in this illustration because it's, it's highlighting the relevant anatomy of the tibialis posterior. But that muscle that's just medial to the tibial tibialis posterior would be the flexor digitorum longus. And then if we go lateral on the other side, on the lateral side of the tibialis posterior, it would have flexor hallucis longus. But if we come back to that medial side where those arrowheads sit, uh, that would be flexor digitorum longus. That's actually part of, as we define it in sports medicine acupuncture, part of the liver sinew channel. Whereas the tibialis posterior, a little bit more anterior um, and, and a little bit more in the middle part of the tibia, you know, lateral to the flexor digitorum longus, is the tibialis posterior as part of the spleen sinew channel. So depending on the depth that the needle's reaching, uh, will also determine really which, at least from a sinew channel perspective, which uh, uh, channels being uh, affected. Uh, so we'll look at, at that aspect as we're doing the myofascial release technique, and we'll discuss it um, also uh, in terms of the channels when we get to the acupuncture portion. But just a heads up, and I'll ref refresh that when we get back to the myofascial release techniques. But this one's talking about the uh, anatomy, and that's the tibialis posterior. That's what the arrows are pointing to. Note that the tibialis posterior comes down the leg, becomes a little bit more medial around spleen six, and then look at how it attaches onto the foot and how much of a support mechanism it creates on the arch of the foot. It's really the, the keystone muscle for that, uh, uh, at least from the extrinsic, from the muscles that are in the leg for creating arch support in the foot. Uh, so I kind of think about the aspect of how the spleen can lift and this uh, spleen sinew channel muscle is really a um, prime lifter of the medial arch. And I, I see that as one of the spleen functions of lifting, you know, in this case of the foot. So if we can go on to the next slide. So uh, medial tibial stress syndrome, like we said, involves the tibialis posterior muscle, commonly occurs, uh, occurs in individuals who are moderately to severely overpronated. Um, because of that line of pole that we were just looking at, how much that um, tibialis posterior influences the lifting of the arch, when you're going into weight bearing and the foot hits the ground, there's a normal pronation. You know, the foot, the arch is gonna drop and that tibialis posterior is gonna be elongated, but there's normal and then there's over pronation where it's just like a flat tire and that tib posterior gets pulled really excessively long probably a little bit in a more of a jarring standpoint. So it doesn't have that normal elongation where there's a little tone there and it kind of checks. It keeps that, that um, pronation in check. It keeps it from going too far out of the boundaries. In this case, it just flattens. So if you were to look at these images here and just glance at the runners that we can see from the waist down, uh, notice which one of those, you know, they're not all hitting, they're not all in the, in the weight bearing part of the gate, but some of them are. Which ones do you notice, or which one do you notice that really highlights that collapse of the medial arch? I'll give you a second just to glance at that. But you can look at the front person, you know, the, the, the weight's falling to the medial arch, that's normal pronation. But if you look at the person just behind him, right in the middle of the shot, um, it looks like I can't tell what the number is, 71 possibly, uh, with the blue, blue shorts. shorts on. Yeah, blue shorts. Um, you can see how much farther that person's going into pronation and imagine that dropping of the medial arch and how excessively that would be pulling on the tibialis posterior. Um, so people with foot over pronation is gonna be a really key thing that you're gonna notice that's gonna affect things like uh, medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, it's very common with runners, uh, accounts for approximately 13 to 17% of all running related injuries. So it's a pretty big one. You'll see it as a prime complaint or at least a secondary complaint in your practice um, You know, frequently if you haven't already. Anything you wanted to add to this one, Matt? Yeah, Brian, I just want to reiterate what you're talking about with the spleen function being lifting the tibialis posterior. This is something that we talked about in the December webinar through the American Acupuncture Council. We spoke oh, about right. Pes planus and the number of different injuries that can actually occur from that. And we actually spent a bit of time um, asking practitioners to look for um, any time of earth signs and symptoms, spleen and stomach, that may be actually contributing to some of the musculoskeletal pain. Because 
with any musculoskeletal injury, there is always going to be some kind of zong fu component, either that the organ and the channel has directly affected that, or that the organ systems are deficient and not controlling inflammation very well. So there's always some kind of zong fu component for the TCM practitioner to take a look at that. So that was the December uh, webinar, something that you, you guys may want to check out on Pez Planus. Uh, Brian's talking right now about the tibialis posterior, but if we look at that person with the blue shorts as well, with the tibialis anterior, that will also end up being elongated with mm -hmm. foot over pronation. So we'll talk about the tibialis anterior in just a little bit. Brian, back to you. Yeah, yeah, and just to foreshadow that, that's going to be the stomach sinew channel. So now we're talking about spleen stomach and and often how those correlate again from a zong fu perspective. How frequently those those two organs are so integrated, you know, that compared to other internal external pairs, those two are just like really function quite often together, and their disharmonies are often uh, associated um, both from a musculoskeletal but even from a zong fu perspective. So. Um, yeah, curious, Matt, about the the um, Zong Fu perspective. I feel, you know, doing Qigong practice, uh, Tai Chi, any really any physical activity, if you take time to strengthen the arch, in my mind, I feel like, and I see this to some extent play out, though it's a little hard to, to test for, but, um, but I feel like you're strengthening the spleen channel, sure, you know, at least the component that's related to the foot, but I feel like that's, that's, strengthening and calling on extra blood flow to that area more communication with the nervous system that that starts to, to be you know at least a component of, of strengthening tonifying the spleen so even from a zong fu perspective that that um, improvement of health for the foot's going to also have a, um, a regulatory effect on the whole system yeah and that's throughout any channel right mm -hmm. i mean if you have a, a excess gallbladder or excess excess liver and deficiency in gallbladder by exercising the hip AB ductors and AD ductors, mm -hmm. it does help to balance that particular aspect. In fact, you can, you can feel the pulse prior to the exercises and feel maybe a sharp edge to a pulse. Some people would call that a wiry pulse and then have the person do hip AB duction and AD ductions and it softens the pulse. And that's mm -hmm. just one example. We could also talk about subscapularis and teres minor. You know, again, but, but Brian's point here is that how important it is to be able to prescribe exercises to your patient. And these are more webinars, isn't it? <laughs> that we had. Actually, how important it is to prescribe exercises to be able to complement your acupuncture treatment based on your differential diagnosis, your TCM differential diagnosis. <laughs> Sorry, Brian, go ahead. No, that's good. Yeah, I think we're ready to jump ahead. Next slide. All right, so some differentiation um, because there's more than one thing, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately because it makes us put our detective hats on and makes life more interesting. Uh, there's more than one thing that can cause pain in this region. Um, so if any time somebody comes in with pain and we just like, ah, medial tibial stress syndrome, uh, we'll get it sometimes and we'll miss it other times because sometimes it's not medial uh, tibial stress syndrome and a common very, very close. I mean, you know, within probably less than an inch uh, of uh, uh, posterior to this where there's going to be pain would be a soleus strain. So just off, you know, not up against the bone, but just off the, uh, the bone, just posterior um, is going to be uh, uh, painful when there's a soleus strain. Because the soleus is a pretty wide muscle and it covers a lot more territory, both medial and lateral than the gastrocnemius. So this would be, again, this is uh, channels are a little odd in the, in the leg compared to the rest of the body because it's along the spleen channel, but uh, the soleus, again, as we have it defined in, in uh, sports medicine acupuncture, would be part of the kidney sinew channel. But we're on, you know, in this case, the pain that often is going to be apparent is really pretty close to that um, kind of most medial edge of the soleus. You know, the soleus covers that whole posterior portion of the, the leg. So it's a big muscle. It's in, in the, the bulk of that soleus really would be the kidney sinew channel. But the distribution of the pain is going to be really along more of this uh, spleen channel, just posterior to the bone. Um, often again in that region of spleen eight, but uh, through spleen seven, it's probably not going to go down as low as spleen six. Um, so something to be aware of, you know, if you're palpating to help confirm the pain, and not so painful right up against the bone, but you back off 
Uh, what would you say, Matt, about half an inch, an inch? At the Pretty most, close. yeah. Like, yeah, at the sometimes most. Sometimes a quarter of an inch sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that's where, oh, you know, that's where the pain is. That's You, you have your fingers right on it. That starts indicating more of a soleus uh, uh, strain. And um, it's pretty close, pretty close in terms of their description of where it's going to be. So something to look for uh, uh, that can help differentiate the pain. And that's going to be different channel correspondence. It's going to be different uh, uh, treatment. We're going to stay with medial tibial stress syndrome for today, but it's good to differentiate. Can I add something there, Brian? Absolutely, please. Yeah, so we can use, this is something that we've talked about in the past before. We talk about it quite a bit, actually, is um, acupuncture as an assessment. This would be when you're in your assessment uh, part of the um, treat of the uh, clinic, uh, the patient visit, sorry, mm -hmm. for the patient visit. And you're trying to figure out, okay, this is a soleus strain. It seems like it's going to be more painful and it's bound up in that myofascial tissue about a quarter of an inch away from the bone. Um, we're saying that it's it's more of the kidney myofascial jing jin, but it's also the spleen primary channel. Okay, so where's the stagnation? Is it in the primary channel or is it in the soleus myofascial tissue um, mm -hmm. in the kidney? What we could do is maybe needle kidney three, we can needle maybe kidney four as part of the assessment, and then go back to that soleus and feel if it's quite a bit softer. Is there less pain with palpation to the patient? If not, maybe we could needle spleen three and spleen four and see if that moves chi within the spleen channel and go back and, and palpate that soleus. Um, from my experience, it's usually going to end up being kidney three, kidney four, and sometimes even kidney five uh, starts to take pain away from that soleus. But it's nice to be able to at least put your detective hat on, as Brian was saying, and figure out Actually, where is that stagnation? Is it more in the spleen primary channel or is it in the kidney jing jin? Yeah, I mean, we could just throw in an ashi point uh, or if you're a little more, have a little more finesse, maybe a motor point. If you know the location for the soleus motor point and you're going to get re results, but you're going to increase those results if you link it with the channel and mm -hmm. um, it start building a comprehensive picture. Hey, Matt, in this image, you can actually kind of see it. You know, we, we highlight this in our cadaver um, classes, uh, uh, you look at it on a, on a cadaver specimen and you can really see that connection. Um, but this, uh, even just in the image here, you can see it quite well because if you follow the soleus through the Achilles tendon and look at its attachment on the Achilles tendon, um, I can tell you that the soleus par portion has a much stronger connection into the medial side of the calcaneal tendon onto the calcaneus. But then uh, in this particular model, you can see how that links through the fascia of the calcaneus and right into the abductor hallucis, which if you drop straight down from uh, kidney six, there's a pretty prominent abductor hallucis muscle that's that's visible um, here. So, you know, that whole chain is, is really uh, um, all part of the same myofascial uh, plane of tissue. And, and as Matt was saying, like kidney five, such a strong point, other, other kidney points might be the ones that are really um, indicated kidney two is the motor point for the adductor hallucis. So if there was a lot of pronation, that might be one to consider too. Yeah, a lot of good choices for this, but that's kind of deviating from the topic of the of the day. So anything else well, are we ready sure. to do? I mean, it's good because we're going a lot more detail on that module three in the uh, mm -hmm. anatomy cadaver lab talking about that with different slides and such and how really how important that is and trying to be able to balance out that calcaneus with any kind mm -hmm. of of ankle injuries or mm -hmm. Achilles tendinopathy and such. So, all right, we better keep moving or we're going to take up all day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so second differentiation to, to consider is a tibial stress fracture. It's it's um, often has a gradual onset. It's a progression of tibial stress syndrome. So um, uh, the, the um, when the tibia is excessively pulling and you're getting these micro tears, especially if the person's really powering through it and controlling it with NSAIDs is a, um, is a, a common dynamic um, to kind of deal with the pain and they keep on working with it, that can progress into a tibial stress syndrome where there's a lot of, uh, uh, starting with a lot of extra osteoblastic cellular uh, activity um, that can sometimes show up on a X-ray, uh, frequently can show up on an X-ray and um, you can kind of see that little cloudy area where the arrows are pointing to, uh, and that can 
progress into a tibial stress fracture. So with that, there's going to be a really exquisite tenderness at a point-specific region on the tibia. So if the, it's not responding to treatment, there, that, that area is um, exquisitely tender where you're palpating, um, even sometimes with very light pressure, this is something to consider and getting some imaging would be the way to go. And I think the next slide shows a little bit more on this map, but if you want to add anything here before we move on. Uh, maybe after the next slide. Yeah, okay. So next slide, yep. So the doesn't always show up on the x-ray because some of that osteoblastic uh, activity is maybe uh, relatively new and it hasn't reached the level where it's going to show up on an x-ray. So you can't really rule it out with a negative x-ray. MRI will show a little bit more. Um, but uh, it, again, it's really, I, I, the way I see it is if it's not responding and there's that you know, point-specific exquisite tenderness, that's the indications that I'd be looking for. Uh, that you would want to consider this tibial uh, stress fracture. Matt, did you were going to add something, I think? Oh, the chia oh, yeah. I think, is another one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, both of these x-rays were from a patient's of mine. Um, and when you are suspecting an osteo increased osteoblastic activity or even as it progresses into even a, a cortical stress fracture, um, like Brian was saying, it is exquisitely tender as you're palpating along the tibia and you find that spot, there'll be a uh, fluid within the tissue. We call that chi edema. Um, and it, the, just the gentleness of pressure for the patient, it hurts quite a bit. Um, so just know this is to try to go and get some imaging. If it doesn't show up on an x-ray, then you want to request a bone scan or even an MRI, but a bone scan is usually the gold standard for that kind of thing. If it's not going to show up on an x-ray, you want to catch that. You want to be the acupuncturist that catches this. Um, and, and because this will come into an acupuncturist office, if you are treating musculoskeletal injuries, uh, it's just something to be able to make sure that you're aware of. Anything else, B? Nope. All right. Oh, my turn. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going into uh, anterior tibial stress syndrome. So this is going to be affecting the tibialis anterior, which is responsible for 80% of dorsiflexion, and it's an incredibly strong decelerator for plantar flexion. So you can see this runner who's running down an incline. He's got heel strike, and so his foot is going into plantar flexion. So that tibialis anterior is slowing down the ankle and the foot. So it's eccentrically lengthening. It's a contraction. So therefore, with overuse, just like the tibialis posterior, it can have micro tearing. Some of the fascial attachments or the muscle fibers microscopically can start to tear away a little bit from that bone, then causing pain. Now the pain, just like tibialis posterior syndrome, is going to be on the bone. So you want to palpate medial to the stomach channel on the aspect of where the tibialis anterior attaches to the tibia bone. That area will be tender if it's going to end up being a shin splints of involving the tibialis anterior. So let's go to the next slide and you'll see the common areas to palpate for this is usually around stomach 37. Generally speaking, I don't think I've ever seen it go all the way up to stomach 36 region. It's usually more toward the muscle belly of it. Um, uh, stomach 37 and even just below stomach 39. So again, I just want to reiterate, it's not on the stomach channel. That's a different injury. That would be a tibialis anterior strain. So if you palpate it on the stomach channel and you feel a, a fascicle of tissue that's really quite hardened and that's causing more pain than when you palpate on the edge of the bone where the tibialis anterior comes close to, right? So then therefore, it's going to be more of a tibialis anterior strain. Why is it important? It's going to be different needle techniques. Same channel that you're working with, same channel correspondences that you can work with, but yet if it's a tibialis anterior strain, we're going to be needling the motor points um, and not necessarily the, um, the, the technique that we're going to be showing you for mm -hmm. shin splints. Now there's something that we should all be aware of. Maybe you already know about this, but if not, make sure that if the person is talk is, is complaining about anterior pain when running, it gets worse during activity and then starts to go away. When you look at the 
front of the leg, the tibia is anterior, there may be a certain shine to the tissue. Let's go to the next slide. It could be chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Now, this is a pretty serious condition that often requires surgery. Um, I've seen this quite a few times at UCSD. The treatments that we applied helped the person, but as soon as they actually started going back into activity, it came right back. Surgery is, in my mind, the better way of going with this. Uh, chronic exertional compartment syndrome is usually occurring with people that are increasing their training or they're changing their running terrain, something of that nature. It could also even be brand new shoes, but they're starting to develop shin splints, anterior shin splints, but yet the pain is going to be more in the tibialis anterior. It's going to be along the bone. It's going to be a, a accompanied usually with a burning or an aching or a pressure sensation. And a big note here, it's often bilateral, 70 to 80% of the time, you'll have this bilateral. So remember that one, that's a key, all right? And then also with this burning, aching and pressure and possible numbness as well, is that um, it usually will start to go away 30 minutes, 15 minutes or 30 minutes after they actually stop their activity. What happens is that the muscle tissue starts to hypertrophy from the increased training or from changing the running terrain and at a very rapid rate. And so the fascia tightens quite a bit. And with that increased pressure within that anterior compartment, and now this can, chronic exertional compartment syndrome can happen to any compartment of the lower leg, but it's most common in the anterior compartment. So this is why I can kind of mimic this tibialis anterior stress syndrome or the shins, anterior shin splints. Is that the, so like I was saying, is the muscle will start to hypertrophy. You'll get the fascia starting to tight. It starts to compress you'll have a decrease of the venous return. So therefore there'll be increase of the interstitial fluid. That's gonna put pressure on the neurovascular structures. Um, it starts to get a lot of compression within that region. Again, you're gonna start compressing against the um, anterior tibial nerve and the deep uh, peroneal nerve, um, getting these signs and symptoms of burning, aching, pressure, numbness. If you do have a patient with that, you wanna refer them out, continue to treat them because you're gonna, you can still help them, but refer them out for further diagnostics with this. Now, it can be a very serious condition if you're gonna be decreasing the amount of blood to the area. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is something that I think is really quite valuable, valuable is to feel the dorsal pedal pulse, which is right next to stomach 42, All right? So this is gonna be a collateral branch off of the anterior tibial artery. So if you go just lateral to the extensor hallucis longus tendon, and just medial to the extensor digitorum longus tendon, you wanna feel for that, that pulse, right? So it's pretty common. Make sure you compare sides. Even if you feel the pulse on the same side of the possible exertional syndrome, if it is decreased compared to the opposite side, you would think of that as being a symptom, right? So as a, sorry, as a possible sign here. So um, feel the dorsal pedal pulse in these kind of cases. It's gonna be pretty valuable information for you. All right, so what else do we have? Let's go next. Can I say something real quickly about that, Matt? Is, yeah, um, some people, some folks are aware of both of these uh, situation, uh, conditions, but um, uh, maybe not, so it's worth mentioning. You know, compartment syndrome, uh, it, for those who might be aware of like more of a uh, uh, traumatic compartment syndrome where you have something fall on your leg, some kind of uh, weight or something like that, you know, and earthquakes and stuff like that, you'll see these with people. That's a, a much more trauma-based uh, uh, condition where you get that swelling, and that can be a you know, really severe emergency condition. Um, this is is like that. It has the same components in that it's it's um, it's uh, restricting and putting pressure on those neurovascular bundles, but it's it's not from you know impact like a trauma, like uh, something falling on a leg or something like that. But uh, a lot of people are aware of, of compartment syndrome, and this is notice the difference of chronic exertional compartment syndrome. So just that yeah, there won't, there won't be blood vessel rupturing or bruising with mm -hmm. this case. Cool. All right. Thanks, B. All right. So let's um, start to get into the treatment techniques with this. Um, at UCSD, I started an externship for Pacific College of Oriental Medicine, which is now called Pacific College of Health Sciences. Um, this was, gosh, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and it still is ongoing. 
So we take the um, interns from Pacific College and we treat the UCSD athletes. And uh, shin splints is extremely common um, there. So we have plenty of experience uh, to, to practice a number of different techniques to see what works and what actually doesn't work. And so um, I developed this study. And this, again, it was just a very, it's a small study. It was only a three week study. We only had 45 people in the pool. Um, there was three groups in the study. One was an acupuncture only study. One was a sports medicine only group. And then there was also a group that was a combination between acupuncture and sports medicine. Now the protocols for sports medicine was ice, stretching and strengthening and also ultrasound. They were using actually both ultrasound and ice in this case, depending on the patient. So they were doing using those four things in the sports medicine group. Um, with the acupuncture sports medicine, we applied the techniques that we're about to go over, the acupuncture techniques, in addition to the sports medicine protocols. And then we also had the acupuncture group was just acupuncture and that's it. Um, so what we found was that at the end of the three weeks, oh, there's one important note, is that almost each one of these athletes were taking a lot of NSAIDs. And they're taking it um, during and before and also after the events because they really need to be able to compete or they're going to lose their position on that team. So um, NSAIDs was, was gobbled down like candy. And so one of the questions that we had with this particular um, study was that they could go ahead and decrease the amount of NSAIDs if they wanted to voluntary, voluntarily. So um, this was something that we found in the study that, that in the acupuncture group, people were actually not taking the NSAIDs and just coming in twice a week for the acupuncture, which was not st statistically significant in the other two groups. Uh, so in this article uh, printed in the journal Chinese Medicine 2002, so way back when, um, it does show that the acupuncture group was actually far superior and the other two groups um, really didn't match up very well as far as getting results. Now, again, this was only a three-week study. There was only 45 participants in this. If we made it an eight or a 10-week study, I would think that the other two groups would actually start coming up. But I think there was actually enough evidence here to be able to show that these needle techniques that we're about to get into um, actually work pretty darn well. Um, and this is something that um, I continue to use and have been teaching in the SMAC program, even before the SMAC program, for a good 20 years now. And um, so we're getting a lot of good results with it. So let's take a look at the next slide. All right, so the key with this, with medial tibial stress syndrome, is to palpate where the top of the pain is on the tibia. And then also, where is the lower range, the lower end on the tibia? So you're going to start your needling at the top, just above the painful area, and you're going to thread a number of different needles. Could be eight, could be 12, could be more, depending on how long the area of pain is. So at each needle will actually, one will go in, and the other one will actually go right on top of it. So it'll be continuous needles all along that edge. Now it's going to be shallow needling, right? And that's going to be very important. You don't want to go deep. When we did go deep, it actually aggravated the condition. So it's a transverse needle technique, no more than 15 degrees, right? You want to thread that needle right along the edge of the tibia as if it is scraping the tibia. You don't want it to go too much into the soft tissue. You want it in the crevice, just off of the edge and on that edge of that bone, that right along that liver channel. Just like, like on liver five, how we try to be able to scrape the bone with that. Think about that with these particular needles. Uh, you don't want the needle at 30 degrees. You want it at 15 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, and then thread that so they overlap all the way down to below the area of pain. Now match this needle technique with your constitutional treatment. You can also go ahead and treat other points with this. For example, we were talking um, spleen points because the tibialis posterior is associated with the spleen gingin. So we want to treat spleen points in this case. Of course, we want to probably treat stomach 36 for the patient, which is also nice because that's the motor point, one of the motor points for the tibialis anterior. So to reiterate, this needle technique is not the only thing that we do, but this is a successful needle technique for helping to decrease pain when you are helping uh, to treat this patient. 
Now for the anterior tibial stress syndrome, which is the next slide, it's the same type of needle technique. It's the exact same idea, and but you're threading in a different area, obviously. So it's right on the edge of that tibia and medial to the tibialis anterior in this case. So um, again, this is going to be something that you want to go ahead and treat the person constitutionally with it. And also you want to apply the myofascial uh, techniques that we're going to be getting into just next, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. One important note, if the patient does have foot overpronation, that this, these needle techniques will help decrease the pain, but the foot overpronation will need to be uh, corrected or helped in one way or another through exercises, treatment. Maybe, maybe the foot is pronated so much that you actually need to be able to get inserts. Um, that's something that we actually talk about in that webinar in December. So the foot overpronation does need to be addressed for long-term clinical success. Brian, you wanna say anything? Um, no, I think it's good. All right, right you want to get into the myofascial techniques? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess we go to the next slide. So we have uh, one one slide and a video for um, tip anterior and for tip posterior. We'll start with tip posterior. Uh, we have videos for these because, as Matt mentioned, um, we picked the subjects. We recently presented on it, and it's now live on uh, Net of Knowledge uh, for some of our classes for the sports medicine acupuncture program. Um, and we recorded uh, some acupuncture, more distal points for treatment of things in the assessment and treatment of the sinew channel class. But we have a lot of myofascial release techniques in those classes, so we have videos for them for presenting at the webinars. Um, uh, just because we have better camera angles, we can we can plan it a little bit better. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have videos for the acupuncture part because we're we're reserving those classes for live classes, just so there's more oversight, um, especially certain techniques that require. Uh, a little bit more oversight where there might be, um, it might cause damage if people aren't doing them correctly. We've, we've reserved those for post COVID um, to do uh, in person. Um, but some of the other classes we were able to do uh, online in webinar form during this time of COVID. So fortunately we have videos for them. It's not to say that these are more important than the acupuncture. It just happens that we have videos for them. So let's use them. Um, so this one uh, we're gonna be working just sinking deep, uh, behind the tibia. And the goal is to kind of move the tissue posterior to soften those connections of the tibialis posterior uh, from the tibia. Uh, with the caveat that if there's extreme discomfort for this, you have to use less pressure or maybe start using this uh, technique as the um, a few sessions in as the acupuncture starts improving the condition. So if the person is retreating from you on the table, either soften the pressure or uh, hold this one in reserve for uh, down the road, but it's usually uh, able, you're usually able to do it. It's a slow technique. You're giving it time, uh, the tissue time to sort of uh, soften and melt a little bit and the connective tissue to sort of um, become a little bit more soluble to, to go from a more gelatinous hard state to a more soluble state. So it's, it's often applicable, but um, you might have to modify pressure, especially on this medial surface that could be quite uh, tender. So you're gonna be sinking uh, soft fingers sink in, take your time, and then slowly moving the tissue posterior as the person does a range of motion with the foot. If it's too much of a range of motion, it can push you out. So, so it has to be a small plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, very slow. You'll see that on the video. So let's go ahead and look at the video and it'll highlight that. This is a complement to the tibialis anterior myofascial release the technique. Again, it could be one that's done along with that one, or it can be done separately. Uh, there's various clinical reasons why you might do one or the other. Um, but the same idea exists is I want to move the tissue from the deep posterior compartment. If I'm lower down around spleen six in particular, it'll be over tibialis posterior. I want to move that tissue away from the tibia and I want to angle my direction down into that deep posterior compartment, multiple muscles there, but my goal is thinking about influencing the tibialis posterior and moving that most anterior most muscle away from the bone and giving more space along the spleen channel and spleen sinew channel. So I'm gonna enter in just posterior to the tibia. Spleen six would be a really good starting point to consider. 
So we'll go in the region of spleen six. I'm angling posterior. I'm gonna have the patient do dorsiflexion. And plantar flexion. This one, especially as I get higher up, it might be a smaller movement. If I can get away with a little bit more movement, I will, but it might get to the point where it feels like his musculature is pushing me out of, out of that little valley, in which case I'll have to minimize the movement. Okay, reposition slightly superior, sink straight towards the table, and then ankle dorsiflexion. Okay, it can be fingers, it could be the flat of the phalanx. Same thing as I drop behind the tibia, I sink down towards the table, and a slight traction posterior. We're gonna do ankle dorsiflexion. That's almost pushing me out, but I'm gonna do it to see if I can open up that tissue a little bit. And relax, good. Move up, sink down, traction posterior slightly, just enough to give a drag on the tissue. Call for movement. I could even consider using the flat of my elbow, but I'd have to be very mindful of depth because this tissue can be very sensitive. Okay. One more pass. Sink down. Traction posterior. Call for movement. That's enough right there, yeah. Too much and we'll push you out, so you might have to minimize the movement. Let's do one final pass. This might be a little bit more on the soleus too, but that's okay. It's still opening up that same space behind the tibia. All right, an excellent technique for tibialis posterior syndrome, as the other technique on the stomach channel would be for tibialis anterior syndrome. It's excellent to open up the ankle dorsiflexion and working on any condition that would be affecting the foot, uh, especially pes planus, and we can look at a modified technique for pes planus specifically. I think we can probably move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, that one I think was most relevant for tibialis posterior stress syndrome. Um, and I know we have not unlimited time, so uh, this is a similar technique. We're on the stomach uh, sinew channel on the tibialis uh, anterior. Very similar idea. I'm going to sink into the tissue. There's a little bit more meat of the tissue to sink into. We have such a narrow space for tib posterior behind the tibia to get to that deep posterior compartment. But the anterior compartment, we really have a little bit more direct uh, access to. Um, another difference with this one is the tib posterior. I'm just kind of angling and stretching away, but I'm not gliding through the tissue so much because then I would just be gliding through the soleus. So it's it's more of a traction. Whereas this one, I'm gonna actually glide through the tibia anterior, but the same goal to help soften those connections uh, to the tibia. So let's go ahead and look at this one. We're looking at a specific myofascial release technique for the tibialis anterior muscle and especially cases, especially useful in cases where it feels like the tibialis anterior is adhered to the tibia in another condition where you might feel a little bit of a loss of a valley. Dense, rigid tibialis anterior and glued and stuck to the tibia. So we're gonna come in with a fist, loose fist. My knuckles are gonna be right up against the tibia, not driving into the tibia, tibial crest, but right up against the tibia as close as I can get to it. I'm gonna angle directly down. I'm gonna go planing through the muscle, but I don't wanna think about it as a round technique where it pulls the leg into external rotation. I wanna think that I'm going straight down to the table and it'll actually squeeze the leg and push it a little bit into medial rotation, or at least it'll influence it towards medial direction. So again, this way around the leg, will pull it into lateral uh, rotation. This way, straight down into the table, we'll push it into medial rotation. So I'm gonna contact, sink perpendicular into the tissue, ask the patient to do some dorsiflexion, toe extension, plantar flexion, 
the reflection. Sometimes it's a little bit faster of a technique, but this tissue feels very stuck here, so I'm going to take my time and let it soften and melt. Come back out. It's not uncommon to see some little tracks where your fingers were, the little finger tracks. I can move down a fist length. I can sink straight towards the table. Ask for movement. And if they can really fully get that foot into dorsiflexion, flexion, there you go, good. And then plantar flexion. Again, even if I take my hand away, it actually pushes the leg more into medial rotation because my intention is just straight down. One more pass, you don't want to go too far down because it can get a little nervy, but about mid leg is good. So one more go. Plantar flexion. Okay. And I'm going to do one more pass, but I'm going to come back up. You don't have to do it this way every time, but this tissue felt particularly congested. Up, ankle dorsiflexion, toe extension, and then down. All right, that's great. So um, just to uh, reiterate on some of the, the first technique for the medial side, if the patient is experiencing what you are thinking of osteoblastic activity where there's a dime-sized spot that is exquisitely tender, you can perform the technique above and below it. Just let pain be your guide. I mean, these techniques are actually very, very useful after the acupuncture technique um, to help free up that area and increase the circulation. Uh, Brian, anything you want to say before we jump into the exercise? No, I think uh, we're ready for that. So with the exercise, this is ankle rotation. This is coming from our postural assessment and corrective exercise class in module three. Um, this is a go-to exercise for shin splints. This is something that's always going to be in the protocol. It won't be the only exercise. It all depends on the patient's posture. Like, for example, if they do have foot over pronation, there'll be a number of different exercises that we teach to be able to um, use with that. This would be one exercise we would throw into that protocol because it does exercise all of the sinew channels, the yin and the yang sinew channels of the lower leg. Um, this is an exercise that actually requires quite a bit of concentration because, because people start to kind of, if their mind is wandering or the, the dog comes and licks the patient's face because they're on the floor, you know, you have to really concentrate with this exercise. Now, in this photo, what you're seeing is the model bring the hip into 90 degrees of hip flexion and then supporting that leg so that the uh, tib and the fib are going to par be parallel with the table, um, parallel with the floor. Then you go into ankle dorsiflexion. From ankle dorsiflexion, you're going to ask the person to make a full range of motion as if you're drawing an O. You do that 10 or 15 times in one direction, and then you do 10 or 15 times in the opposite direction. Now, to work the opposite side, you'll notice that the model has dorsiflexion. So this is going to be an exercise that you want to work on both sides. Even if the person is going to be having shin splints on one side, exercise both sides because there is going to be a crossover neurologically and also with the channels. So this is a really great exercise to really um, before running and also after running. It helps really loosen up that lower leg quite a bit um, before the run and it helps to uh, loosen up the leg quite a bit after the run as well. Brian, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, when they're doing the exercise, I know this is by hand, so you just have to use a little imagination here. But if the person has eversion and they're already, you know, you can look at the the video, uh, the webinar we did on Pez Planus, we go into it a little bit more than I have time here. But if they're in eversion and their ankle and foot position is such that it's going to encourage that that turning out um, whether they're pointing the foot down into plantar flexion or up into dorsiflexion, and they have a much harder time going up and in or down and in, which is going to engage tib anterior and tib posterior. Um, when they do this, they sometimes cheat a little bit or, or they're like a little, uh, a little iffy on the both uh, down and in and up and in portion of it, but they're very strong on the up and out, down and out portion of it. You really have to coach them to make sure they're they're 
fully getting that foot turned in in both directions, whether they're going clockwise or counterclockwise. So don't let them just kind of like, you know, bully it into one direction and kind of like, eh, not quite there in the other direction. You have to give them a, a little bit of incentive or, and kind of bring that to their attention at least. Yeah, that's a good point. Watching your patient perform the exercise before they go home and do it. And a lot of concentration each time, making sure they're going into the complete range of motion. If the mind starts to wander, it's going to be really easy just to kind of flap it around a little bit, which is not really doing very much. It's not really exercising this. Um, this is also called shin burners. And after doing it 10 or 15 times yourself, you'll understand why it's also called shin burners. It's, it's a difficult exercise. It's a fantastic exercise, especially for shin splints. Anything else there, Brian? No, I think we are good. All right. So here's some contact information, you guys. Um, uh, thank you so much for attending. It looks like we really went over time with this. And so for you guys that hung out the whole time, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we wanted to thank the American Acupuncture Council again for having us with this sports acupuncture webinar. Um, Brian, it's always a pleasure hanging out with you. And yeah, you too, Matt. Anything else that we should say? Oh, yes. Next week, make sure that you are back for Lauren Brown. He's going to be discussing um, some topics, whatever Lauren is going to be talking about. It's always excellent. He's got that unique ability to be an amazing clinician and a real quite an academic as well. So um, Lauren is a great guy and somebody to be able to listen to. All right. Thanks, you guys very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.